Hi, if you are on subscriber list, you probably recognize me and you know who I am. However, if you've been to Maker Central and you just stumbled across this video, you probably have no idea. So let me fix this. That's probably better. Now, before I'm gonna take you almost a year ago to the Maker Central 2023, I have a short disclaimer. First, big apologies because this video meant to be released probably earlier than that. This is the actually the last um, sensible date to release it just before Maker Central 24 and tell you all about it. So do apologize for that. And the second apologies I have to make is about the audio quality because hardware has let me down. The environment was quite noisy and literally I wasn't quite prepared for it. And one of the reasons why this video is so late is also because working with the audio was difficult and until some of the AI tools became available, I had no real way to fix it. So forgive me that and hopefully you won't be as annoyed at the audio as I, I was while editing the original tracks. And the last thing, I am coming to Micah Central 2024, hopefully with my camera and much better audio setup, so I'll be talking to people again. With that said, enjoy the content. Hey guys, I supposed to f no. Hey guys, I supposed to film this intro at the very first day of Maker Central. However, I got distracted with all the wonderful projects and there we are. The Maker Central is almost over and I decided to take my camera around and talk to people to find out what they brought and what ideas they're going to leave the Maker Central with, which is super exciting. So, I'd like to take you for a journey around this exhibition hall. And let's talk to some people because, hey, there's some really cool things that you want to see and uh, I'm about to show you all that. Sailing, Stop. rocketry and flying. What else? What are the other passions that people don't know about? Oh, I really like salsa dancing, but I don't ever post about it because it's just like a thing I do for me. But yeah, I was on a salsa team in college. It's nice because salsa is always like nighttime, so I can work all day and get frustrated and then just let it out at night, which is, which is nice. If you catch the flying bug, it's with you for life and you can never get rid of it. It's just like a core part of who you are. Um, and I was super inter interested in flight and birds and like the, I, the concept of flying as a kid and it's sort of in the vein of like, I want to build my own wings and fly. Um, and then I learned about airplanes. I was like, oh, this has already been solved. I can do this. Um, and so I joined a program that like takes kids up on their first flight for free called the Young Eagles through uh -huh. um, the Experimental Aircraft Association. It's available throughout the United States. And... Um, I got, I got on my first flight and the pilot let me fly a little bit and I was like completely hooked. It was just like for life. Once you catch that bug, you have it. Flying first, rockets on the side. Sorry, I know that could start a war, but in the Aero Astro world, I'm more, I love them both, but I would pick Aero. I never thought I'd gonna be doing controversial interviews. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna start like a, start a war on your channel. Women in tech, is it hard? It's an uncomfortable thing that people don't really want to talk about or admit because um, it shows shortcomings in society and it also, I think a lot of times people only see like perceived benefits, like there are extra scholarships available for women um, without really acknowledging how much they, like there's a reason that those extra scholarships are available and 
if you only hate on the extra scholarships without acknowledging that the problem is there in the first place and the damage that that problem causes, then you're missing the point. I think especially when I was first starting in robotics as like the only woman or one of only a few women on robotics teams, um, I always felt a little bit like I had to represent all women and that if I messed up, it was like a reflection on all women or all girls. And the reality is that if you're so scared of messing up, um, you're gonna not do your best work and you're also going probably fail more often. And so I think learning to fail gracefully is the skill that like made me into an adult or into an, en an actual engineer. Talk was about the joy of never making the same thing twice. And, um, but what I was really trying to get across was that like, I am not better at any one skill than any of you guys, or like anyone, and what I have instead is, like I'm comfortable starting a project that I don't know how it's gonna end. And I instead have a complete trust in myself to figure it out as I go. And that's like, I think the core of what makes a really great maker is to be able to trust yourself. If you could pick anyone in the world to work with on a project, who would you pick? and why, and what would you work on? Oh my gosh. I could pick anyone in the world to work with on a project? Yes, they have to be alive. I've never been asked this question before. Success. <laughs> I'm being super proud because I did something special. I'm completely stumped. Anyone in the world, they have to be alive. Preferably. Okay. I would say um, Jacob Collier who's a musician that's very open to working on like whimsical art tech things. Like he's done a lot of stuff with the Media Lab and I think like interdisciplinary stuff really excites me. And like music is a world that I appreciate and I know a little bit about, but I'm like certainly no expert in. And so working with someone who's brilliant at something completely different than me, I think would create like a really cool I think it's fair to say that you are a role model to a lot of people. So who are your role models? Role models to me often are people actually in my life. And I try to surround myself with friends that are inspiring and push me to be better versions of myself. And I kind of try to like take traits that I admire in a lot of people I've worked with and like work on them in myself. Um, so I have, yeah, like my, my family as a whole. Um, but also I think especially throughout high school and college, I did a lot of like looking up to people that were only a year older than me or two years older than me and thinking like, how can I get myself to that point in a year? And that's such a more attainable goal than looking at like, you know, the CEO of some company and being like, how do I get there? That's like really far away. What's next for Sila? This past year has been like really pretty rough for me, honestly. I got robbed a couple times. I had some, really? had some health issues. And like the place I found a lot of joy and solace was camping and going outside I've always loved backpacking and just outdoorsmanship. Um, and so I think some of the projects I'm doing this summer are gonna be more outdoors focused because they're things that I really enjoy. Um, and I have like a really cool backyard now. So I wanna like make sure that I can like build a space that's really enjoyable, so. So how are your, bo how are your boats faring right now? My boats are all still floating as far as I know. Um, I sold one of them, so I don't know what, it, what it's doing. I sold the party kayak. I don't know what it's doing anymore. Um, and the sailboat I just finished, and it's with the youth program in Seattle, so it'll be beat up by the end of the summer, but that's how it should be. Like, we, we make things to be used, and so I want a bunch of kids to ram it against docks and against other boats, and like that's, that's why we make stuff. Awesome, thank you for being such an awesome maker. Of course, thank you so much for having me. Great, thank you. Killed it. Selfie? Yes.
Friday Clean and Emily. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Warm. Feeling right. pretty good. Yeah, tugged. Hot and sweaty? A little bit. It's not too bad. Right now it's been, what, three hours? We got in the suit around noon. No idea what time it is now. I already have enough B-roll to make you look awesome, but what you have to tell me is the most embarrassing things that you cannot do in a suit. You just start with you. Ooh, using the bathroom is uh, just a no-go. Can't do it. Got to hold it like an adult. Or just go. Uh, sit down. I can't sit or take a break or anything. I just kind of end up doing this weird little squatting motion. Yeah, I can't use stairs. Um, I mean, I can. I can start at the top of the staircase and fall down it. But uh, aside from that, no. You can fly too, but once. Once. I've seen you trying to write an autograph. That was quite challenging. That, yeah, yeah, that, that was a little hard because, uh, you know, I, I don't really have the greatest of uh, grip kind of thing and my fingers don't bend all the way, so I... Hold my finger. You can't. So... I do that. Every time I try to talk, I hit the chin button and uh, I close my face plate when I'm talking to you. That's actually quite cute. How long does it take to get from a roll of filament to this? It took me about a year, kind of on the side here and there. I had a full-time job, so I was only able to work on it after work and weekends. The first time I did it, I did it over a summer, so I had a little bit more time. Uh, I did it in about six to eight months. I rushed this one, and I worked on this one full-time, not with like a full-time job behind it. Uh, and this one still took me a good solid three months. I know already that you didn't know each other when you started, right? Who started first? So I made a foam one a long time ago. I was 14, so when the Avengers came out, 2012-ish. Um, and then I ended up making my first printed one in about 2017 or so, or 2018, around that time frame. I started in 2019 making this suit. This is my first suit. It has some wear and tear on it, uh, so it's definitely been used well. Yeah. Uh, how often do you have to reprint pieces that break? Um, it's not so much as reprinting them, but you are able to repair them, re-weld them, re-sand them. Um, it wants the paint's too bad, maybe a repaint. Uh, you're really going to reprint stuff as you're fitting and building it when things don't fit. You've been working on this one suit, and you've been putting a lot of work into one suit kind of thing to make it like nearly perfect. Every time I'm sick of a suit, I just start over and build a new so I haven't really printed new parts, but I've just been like, I'm going to make a new suit and improve the whole thing, which would probably be better if I just focused on a couple pieces, but that's what I end up doing. Do you have to maintain a diet to fit a new suit? Uh, no, I am naturally a stick, and it pulls, I guess, in a way. Yes. Um, there was one time at Economy a year and a half ago, I was trying to get the, the abs wrapped around, and they were suddenly a lot tighter than they used to be. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> should really lay off at McDonald's now. So it's good incentive to stay in shape. And that you're also standing and walking around all day. You have weight on your shoulders. So yeah, going to the gym helps. Apart from the light effects, uh, what else your suit is capable? Obviously you have a base guard uh, out on the bottom, but what other tricks do you have in your suit? So this one, all it does is just the lights and the palm arc and the helmet. In a previous one, I had some flaps on the shoulders. I had some flaps on the back, um, but just, Never had time to incorporate the back flaps on this one thus far, but hopefully at some point I will. Pretty much the same. It's lights. It's a light show. Um, I do also have an attachment that goes with it, the backpack up there. Uh, that flickers and flashes too. But because it's the nanotech suit, it doesn't have any hidden panels or flaps and missiles. They get generated out of nanotechnology BS. What's next for you guys? Uh, is it next uh, Mark, I don't know, 1020? Mark 85. Oh, you got to jump into another project. Personally, I want to start making videos about things that aren't Iron Man related, but I also still enjoy doing this. So I enjoy doing it for myself kind of thing. So I might make another suit. I might make a Mark 7, maybe stop post about it quite as much um, and make my content more just like 3D printed oriented in general, um, but still do this on the side because that is what I like to do with this fun. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, I'm actually remaking this entire suit because I, I, there's been so many problems with this suit. It's broken, it's cracked, it's seen a lot of wear and tear. So I want to make a brand new one because I've learned a lot in three years. I've gotten better at this. But then I'm also making a Gundam cosplay suit. So I'm branching out into an anime cosplay that I'm very excited about. Pick a maker, pick a person that inspires you, and what project would you like to work on with them? I think it'd be really fun 
to work with either Mark Rober or Kyle Hill on making some type of sciencey robot project. I think that'd be very entertaining. Think of YouTuber y type people when I think of stuff like this too. A lot of the popular makers nowadays are YouTubers. They're science communicators, they're educators. So there's, it's hard to find makers who aren't putting themselves out there in that aspect now. Everybody, for better or worse, is behind a camera, and there are a lot of awesome people who are amazing makers who just also love sharing that. So a lot of them are just YouTubers. <laughs> Fair enough. And lastly, throughout the show, because it's the second day, what was your favorite thing that you'd seen uh, make a central? Did you know? I didn't know until I got here. Emily, the engineer, was going to be here. I didn't know. I, she, she, well, she's right here. He showed up beside him. He had no idea. And then I, I put my banner up beside his name, and I was like, gotcha. I'm here. You don't. I think, I think the coolest thing was everybody here is stoked about what they do. Every maker here loves talking about woodworking or blacksmithing or electronics. Everybody who's here with a booth is proud to show and geek out what they love. And everybody can relate to that. Even if they don't like Iron Man suits, they see that we like them and are passionate about it. And it's just, everybody is just happy to be here. Yeah, I mean, like the most science-y, I think, convention that we've been to thus far has been Silicon. And uh, this is far more maker related than silicon itself. Um, people enjoy, I feel like, talking shop a lot more as far as 3D printers and stuff go. I like that aspect of it, it's been fun. Question we haven't gotten here, because it's a maker event, is where did you buy those? If we go to a Comic-Con, that's a very common question. Hey, where'd you buy that suit? Because a lot of people buy their customs. Nothing wrong with that. But because this is a maker event, it's kind of already assumed we made these. So it's, everybody's on level playing ground and uh, it's just, it's a different culture, it's cool. And two. Ah, we won't get it. Yeah, that was perfect. And I have a Phoenix puppet. Why does it look angry and uh, looking at me in a so peculiar way? Well, because he's probably hungry. I'm afraid he might be dinner. <laughs> really, I'm obsessed with birds uh, since a very young age, so it's building on um, knowledge that I've just gained yeah, over years and years. This particular puppet took just over two years, but I've made other birds before, and um, so it's really just building on. So do you have actual education in, in birds? Um, my mum's a biologist and my dad's um, an engineer, so like we saw. <laughs> and they had a child. And they had a child and they made bird puppets. <laughs> this one took um, just over three years of not constant work, but uh, constant obsession and like tinkering in my brain and thinking about it and trying to work out. So originally it was a magpie. I had a family of magpies that would come and visit my uh, bedroom window and I'd feed them mealworms and I just fell in love with them. They were such like fun little characters. I just, I just call it hand controls. I've got no formal puppet training, so I don't really know what they're supposed to be, I suppose. Um, but the, I, I just call it the hand controls. It's the, the holding on bit. <laughs> and how many fingers do you need to control it? About 20. <laughs> how many do you have? On each hand. <laughs> um, I've got like the normal amount. And then on the wing bar, if you twist it, it opens and closes the little alule feathers. Uh, the tail is on my wrist. It moves up and down and flares the tail and then there are levers to kick the legs forward and pull the legs in for in-flight mode um, and then there's a lever which pulls the neck in and then the three points on the head give it really nice sharp snappy movement and then I've got individual string for the crest and for the beak. And I've got a little sparrow as well that was my first puppet that I flew around here in 2019, I think it was. And I uh, got, got really good feedback and it was the first time I'd done puppets outside. So it was really nice to be here. Prawn, I really like doing fantasy creatures because you don't have uh, like a set thing that it's got to be. Um, so I think maybe a unicorn and you've got a lot of uh, creative freedom with it. 
but also a frog. <laughs> I think I might make a frog, <laughs> like a little hopping. Like I think the hopping mechanism would be really interesting to get that looking realistic, you know. I am Leah Matthews Art um, on Instagram and TikTok, and I have a Patreon and a Facebook as well. That's, that's what I do. <laughs>
So we have been asking kids for their inventions today. Um, so uh, these are some ideas that kids have drawn for us. This is a particularly brilliant one. This is um, uh, a, an invention that fires giant spinning discs, to, blades to cut grass. We're next door to Colin first, so that feels like a very Colin invention, um, but it's, uh, that could be quite a fun one to make. I think that's some sort of child label roles that prevent them from designing stuff. We always find that we visit schools and things and we sort of, you know, do lots of stuff for kids. And actually, the, um, we kind of find that kids are almost like born engineers. We all get a lot of our kind of creativity and our sort of inventiveness and our innovation kind of trained out of us as we go through school and come older. Like, if you ask kids for invention ideas, every child will come up with some new novel idea. Ultimately, everyone's ideas are valuable. If you could give a single tip to a future maker or inventor, age four and above, yep. what would that be? It would be that no idea is too crazy. Uh, like, we, like in, our, in our profession, it's like, actually, the, the more weird and wonderful idea is, um, you know, sometimes even the more impossible it seems, actually, that is like the perfect starting point from which to innovate to... You know, to make something that you could bring to life in the real world. So just like, yeah, go in as like thinking as crazy as you can, and then work from there. Do I watch YouTube outside of YouTube? I went through a phase of watching a load of people doing string art. Have you ever seen that? Which is where they like create like a replica of like the Mona Lisa by just by tying bits of string between like uh, nails or screws they put into wood. I got really into watching Becky Stern's videos. Love Becky Stern's videos. Um, my friend Ruth, who do, I do YouTube stuff with, um, Ruth's been putting some great videos on her channel. And it's um, we do this thing called YouTube Makers Secret Santa every year, um, where you know different YouTube makers make stuff for each other, and that's lovely because it's like that takes us as well as other people who are watching it on this journey where you discover new new people or new builds or new projects or new ways of making. Um, and it's, it's really funny because it's like we're part of that but we also get to go on the journey of discovery because we don't know because it's all secret yeah. we don't actually know what everyone's made until they've made it if you could pick someone in the world not only to you know, limit it to YouTube to work on the next project who would, would you like to work with? yeah I think it would be really nice to do um, to make some things um, with some, some climate activists and with some people who are kind of using art to spread important messages around um, the environment and around the climate crisis. Yeah, there are lots of really, really exciting stuff going on in that kind of art meets environmentalism space, um, which I think is something that I find quite exciting. Well, I hope you're enjoying uh, Maker Central. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've had a lovely time and um, yeah, great to chat. It is scary. It's a little bit scary. It's based on Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. They were called T1, and you see them in the film for about two minutes. That was 20 years ago. The film was released in 2003. It inspired us to make a robot, and we wanted to build a tracked robot, and we've been struggling with how to build a tracked robot ever since. It's Robot Central. It sounds like a company. I work for a robotics company, and we don't do anything like this. <laughs> when we made this robot, we thought, yeah, let's take it out and show it to people. A little bit scary. So we made up the whole concept of Robot Central in that we thought, what happens when there's no more wars? Let's make the robots do the washing up and the cleaning, and it's become Robot Central Domestic Division. This is your home friendly domestic robot. Uh, you repurposing war machines into do a house duties, or are you selling a basically a equivalent of a Roomba with miniguns on it? <laughs> yeah. She does it all. And even she does swing her hips a little bit, so if you want to take her down to the disco with you, she can accompany you to the disco or maybe even your Zumba class. There is a camera in there. I can see the camera. Yeah, okay, so we've been showing everybody all weekend because we just think this is fabulous. James Bruton came and he saw our robot and he said, you need to do a little bit of object recognition here. And he taught us all about it, which thanks, James, it was absolutely brilliant. But we basically put a Raspberry Pi 4 in here with a little camera 
and then when we it process, we downloaded some free software, which is CV Library, and we've been showing people the software. You don't have to be a coder. You just download the software, run it, and it recognises about 800 objects, including people, which we changed the labelling a bit. And the, when it sees a person here on the screen, you can see it says terminate because it's a naughty robot. If it's a Roomba and it vacuums stuff, it takes out the trash. But uh... <laughs> these things... <laughs> I think we need to program it to recognise the trash as well and take that out. <laughs> so are you planning to integrate the vision into some basic controlling and aiming procedures? Don't tell anyone, but we did manage to take the output from the Raspberry Pi and trigger it so that when it saw a person, it would move its arms and spin its guns. How long does it take to design a machine like this? We started the project in January and it's taken about a year. We have other jobs come in, of course, you know, so we're not working on it full time. I'd say about nine months of solid work. Not to 60? Not to 60. It does 15 miles an hour. Takes a little bit to get there. Um, how many bullets per minute? Thousands. <laughs> um, target piercing bullets? <laughs> now you're getting too technical for me. <laughs> I see some rockets. I see some rockets, yeah. People have been asking all day, are the rockets real? Hmm. We don't tell, we don't tell. Pitching something as a deadly robot that is essentially a, a wheelchair. A wheelchair made of wood. So we wanted to use electric motors. We've got two 450-watt wheelchair motors. And in the end, we had the idea of using a composite material, which we use plywood... Um, webbing that goes that does the joins, which is a material, but we got some with a two-ton braking strain. And um, we were very fortunate to know a very friendly mathematician who helped us work out the diameter and the, and the detailing of the track. Is this done? Or is it, 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 are you moving to a next project, or is it uh, you're going to still continue working on this? So Tiffany, she's got to practice her social skills now. This is her first time out. We're hoping that she will go out and meet lots of people and maybe she could become an influencer. I don't want this to meet people. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. She's fine. She's friendly. We've got her gun caps on. She's got a red eye. <laughs> she's looking at you. We actually made the little Johnny Five toolbox today because we knew Johnny Five was coming and earlier today we got them both together and they had a bit of a dance off and that was really, really cool. But yeah, there's loads more in the pipeline for Pad Studios. Okay, and if you could introduce Tiffany to a potential mate partner in the future, what robot would that be? Oh, well, I think it has to be a strong robot. Yeah, I mean, definitely not C-3PO. <laughs> <laughs> That's very... They're, they're, I've seen a couple of droids, you know. Yeah, there are some R2s here, and she's had a little look at them, but, you know, she's like, Pah, flee, go away. <laughs> That's great. So where can people find more about this robot and about you guys. Yeah, so just follow Podpad Studios. We've got Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. And we put loads of videos about how we made her because it was a labour of love. Um, so you can watch the whole project through. And uh, yeah, please give us a follow and we'll put out when we're going to events. Hi, Nicholas. I recognize definitely this one, but you have to introduce me to the rest of your pack. Well, that's clearly Vecna from Stranger Things. I hope I hope it did a good enough job that it's obvious who that is. But and there's Natiri, which I just finished one. This is the one I just finished most recently, and I actually did the hair here. Uh, she came in bald, and I sat here and did the hair and the jewelry. Um, but I, I hope the outcome was satisfying. Yes. So it takes one maker central to finish the hair. Uh, it did. It took most of the day yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it did. I, I did a shortcut though, and I got. I had it pre-braided. The first one I did, I had to do all the braids myself. So I didn't want to go through that again. I don't know how the women do it. All that. Uh, that's the Annie Titan, the female Titan from Attack on Titan. Clicker from The Last of Us. Jeff the Killer, the creepy pasta character. Cryptosporidium 137, the little one over there. That was for uh, THQ. 
I did. And Snoke, who turned out to be a big nothing burger in the new in the new uh, sequel series. Um, Pennywise and Creature from Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Potter. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that the um, scary runs in the family. Uh, so uh, is what are you it trying to say? Oh, I'm trying to say that your choice of characters is uh, films and games. You know, I did a poll recently on on my channel to see what people wanted me to, to make. I think it was 80 some odd percent came back they wanted more scary, dark, creepy things. I didn't do that on purpose. In fact, I like the fantasy stuff more. I'd rather make characters like her. Um, but one of my favorite ones I did was uh, Deet from The Dark Crystal. It's gorgeous. I love it. Dobby, things like that. That's what I'd like to make more. Um, but apparently there's just a big demand for the creepy stuff, so that's what ends up happening. So where do you find yourself between um, following what your audience was, uh, wants and um, you know, chasing what you actually want to do? No, I, that, that, it's a negotiated position for a lot of us because often what you want to do... So I'd like to make my own unique characters. People want to buy sculptures that are relevant to them, their favorite character. How do you survive? How do you support yourself? I can't sculpt or do anything I want to do. But then there's also, you know, it's a negotiated position because you don't want to do things you absolutely hate. And then it, what is that? Then it becomes just a, a regular job that you didn't want in the first place. So I try to find a convergence between things I find attractive and I want to do anyway that I think the audience will respond to. What is the workflow? The workflow? Well, it starts in clay, block like that, work it by hand. Um, you can watch the whole process on my channel, of course. Uh, work it by hand, use hand tools, and then you get the image that you want, and then you solidify that image by making a mold. And then you pull the original out, which usually gets destroyed, and you fill the mold with the void space with the uh, more preferred material, in this case, silicone. Do you, would you consider something like that, working with a model and then turning them into some sort of, I don't know, cyberpunk uh, sculpture bust? For measurements, it would really help to get it more accurate. But, I mean, when you say that, I get it conjures images of, like, you know, naked people sitting in my flat for six hours, and I'm like, I don't know, what kind, of, what kind of sculpture am I doing? Nowadays, you have access to 3D scanners, and you can scan people's heads and faces. But often, though, a lot of sculptors will cheat and just take the print and then make direct molds of that and just make that. So I don't do that. I don't do that. I, I feel like that's cheating. The sculpt on Vecna was one of my favorites because it was so detailed. But the detail doesn't always translate so well to the color version. Like I, I, I have the, the clay version in, the, in my flat, and I, I'll look at it and go, that's amazing. But it's blank, you know? It's like something about it in clay form makes it look more amazing to me than this does. If you wanted to take this to another level and cooperate with someone, who would you like to work and, well, with, and what would you do? Barry Gower, he's, uh, he did the Night King, all the effects on the White Walkers, and then he did such a good damn good job, they hired him for Chernobyl. And then they hired him to do The Witcher. And then they hired him to do Vecna. Um, and uh, then I did The Clickers from The Last of Us in the new show. So the guy's like, he's the industry's leading practical effects guy now. What is your next project? Do you have um, already something in mind that you're going to scope next? Yes, I do, but I'm trying to keep that kind of quiet. Okay, we know it's Star Wars. I think they'll like her. It's Star Wars and it's her. Uh, Post your comments and choices. Who, who, who's that going to be? And we'll find out who's who's right, basically. Right, where people can find all of these things. That's it. Enjoy your make Maker Central, and thank you. Thank you, my man. Sam, first time I've seen you was at EMF um, last year, and I was quite impressed with your show. Thank you very much for that. What did you bring today? Oh, uh, well, um, I've bought a 
pretty much the same thing. The synthesizer that's over there, the gig, uh, that's my Cosmo gigging synthesizer. Then I bought the Teletubby Tidal Wave, which is a Teletubby to do a wave. And then another couple of old bits and bobs to show people. Uh, actually, your neighbor, Matt, has yeah. paid you a compliment saying that you've got a really nicely labeled stuff on your synthesizer. Uh, is it all hand-drawn or do you use like a CAD machine to, to create the labels? Um, mostly it was hand-drawn. I did it with Silver Sharpies. And then as time's gone on, I've been building, uh, designing kits for people to build. So now there's uh, printed circuit boards that are etched on the front panels. What got you into making this stuff uh, in the first place? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I tried to build a guitar pedal and then I was like, ooh, that's interesting. So I modified toys to make a musical and I started building synthesizers and it went from there. Given the opportunity to, to work with any musician out there, who would you like to collaborate most with? Beethoven. Uh, who would you like to collaborate most with that is still alive? <laughs> Elvis Presley. Oh, no, I've got up late, I've got up late. I, don't know. I really don't know. That's a really I, I, the only reason I was trying to act, act silly because I don't know. There's um, that's tough. What's your musical inspiration? Then? What's what's the music that you listen to when you have a moment to yourself and you want to relax? I whistle to myself. I'm not joking. I just whistle. I love whistling. I, I just like listening to what's whatever's on at the time. Like just take it in, not really choose it, but let the fate decide what you're hearing when you're creating a new a new instrument or well, like I don't know how to call them sometimes but an, in, an instrument what is your design process what you start with and uh, how you progress oh I don't know it's all different um, just a random idea and then try and figure out how to do it uh, usually the idea comes in the shower you know you're like ah, oh yeah I'll do that and then you do it <laughs> like, I was quite impressed in how quickly you can switch between the instruments during your live performance and you feel oh, comfortable yeah. with stuff uh, what is your oldest instrument that you have? Oh, guitar. I started with guitar, playing guitar. I don't play it as much anymore because I play synthesizers, but yeah, I'm a guitarist. And uh, which synthesizer that you've made is the oldest? It's called the Cosmonaut, and it was just a, it's just a, a copy of a Korg MS-20 that I built. What was your favourite thing so far that you've seen? Johnny Five over there. That was quite impressive. I love jo Johnny Five. is my favourite, yeah, robo. If you're going to build a robo from a film it's got to be Johnny Five. Imagine Johnny Five trying to play on an organ. <laughs> All right thanks so much for talking to me. Thanks Mark. Make us central. Is it? This is still your first time here. No, it's my fourth time here. I was here the very first one in 2018. I think it would have been. Uh, that's nice. And the previously, I've seen you at the EMF camp as well. Uh, yeah, I've been actually to the two previous ones. So it's 2018. I was there with Matt Denton and the Mantis Robot, helping him out with that. And last year, yeah. And now the next one's 2024. Oh, I really liked uh, Low Mom Low Computers by Cynthia. I think that's his first time here. So he's got some of his uh, Cosmo synth. So that's been good to see. And the uh, Mexican wave of Teletubbies. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's good. And the Collins back again. So get to see the screw tank in person, all those good things. It looks so definitely impressive. You've got your uh, ball chair with you, is that it? Yes, the big omni wall wheeled vehicle. Because uh, I made a small one. Everyone said, made one you can ride on. Were you allowed to drive it here? I haven't tried, but Matt put his go-kart on the floor. And as soon as it touched the ground, it was like security guards standing behind him. What are you doing? So, uh, yeah, I haven't tried driving it. So it's, it, it doesn't really go where you want, so it's going to be dangerous. In a drag race uh, against Matt, who would have won? Oh, well, with a go-kart? Yes. Oh, he'll win that, yeah. How about Good going race. sideways? Uh, going sideways, does he have to, like, three-point turn like this? Yes. Then I'd win. Uh, your recent video was about uh, Dr. Octopus tentacles. Yeah. There were only four on uh, Dr. Octopus, and with his four limbs, that makes yeah. it eight. Yeah. Uh, are you going to go for the full 
age version. Um, I don't know. I'm going to do a version two that's probably going to be much bigger. Uh huh. And so the bottom ones, because of the load that will be on it, are going to be ball screws. Then we'll probably have two stages of ball screws, then two stages of lead screws. Then I don't know something else for the next two, and it'll be like a big thing on a massive base. Probably barely lift itself by the time it gets to the very top. That's the problem with it. Fiction, you know, Dr. Octopus walking on the actual tentacles. That's going to be, that'll be very hard to achieve. And I think with the tentacle, with all of those actuators, all of the tentacle, they all have to be strong enough to lift a human. Asking you this question is quite difficult. I've asked a lot of people uh, who would they would like to work with next. Like if they, if you could choose anyone, like, not okay. just YouTube, but anyone. Yeah. Uh, who would like to collaborate with and what would that project be like? Um, it's Kids Invent Stuff, which we're talking about now. Like, I can't tell you it's a secret. It's a dangerous project. Oh, wait, they do. So there, there's a plan. So kids sometimes do send in things that are too dangerous. We're, uh, so on Tuesday, I've, uh, my project is building a crash test dummy. Uh-huh. So that's all I'm going to say. And if people want to find you, they should go to... YouTube.com slash James Bruton or X Robots UK on all other social media. For all your fancy robots. Thanks so much, Lily Joe Makers Centro. Thank you, thanks. Hi Matt, everyone knows you for this. Yes. How fast is it? Currently 30 miles an hour. 30 miles per hour. But my important question is, due to oversized um, builds, does it come with an equally big instruction manual? <laughs> Interestingly, this is the one thing you don't have to scale up is the instructions. But you would have to scale up the box. Uh, recently I've seen online that there was a battle about who has a bigger mechatronic mantis, I guess? Oh yes, yeah. Uh, so is yours really bigger one? How do you, st how do you st decide what determines the biggest? Is it weight? Is it leg displacement? Is it area? I don't know. If you notice, mine was the largest, Guinness World Record for the largest, largest operational mantis hexapod. So I think you can't just take two steps and say, I've built a hexapod and have, and have it fall apart. So how far do you have to walk it to call it operational? Well, I asked Guinness World Records that when they first did my record. So I was like, do you need to see it like do, I don't know, 100 metres or something? And they actually said, we've seen so many videos of you covering large distances. You've already proved it works, you know, so they didn't need to see it. I'd say you've got to do at least a mile. Basically means you've got to build something that's going to last. Because mine's 10 years old now and it's still going. So, What's the fuel consumption on that thing? The fuel consumption, to do a mile, you're probably going to be looking at about two gallons of fuel. Yeah. Do you get taxed us on the bagel? I, I should get taxed, <laughs> but it's an off-road vehicle, so... You are in a unique position to create big machines and, uh, well, it seems like the sky is your limit. What would be the most challenging build you would like to embark on and who with? I'd quite really like to build... Uh, I mean, I've always loved walking machines. If, if it was possible, I'd love to build a, like a full-size ATST scout walker, two-leg bipedal, especially in that design. It's such a beautiful design. In fact, my talk later on has a little nod to that, you'll see. But, uh, yeah, something like a big chicken walker thing, you know. But that wouldn't be made out of Lego bricks, right? No, no, they'd have to be steel, I think, steel fabricated. Um, I don't know, who would I do that with? Probably someone crazy like James or Colin, you know, someone crazy enough to build something on a large scale. Is it 3D printing that got into your whole, let's make big um, Lego bricks or something else got you into that idea? No, just 3D printing. I think, um, obviously, having a love of Lego when I was a kid, Le Lego Technic in particular, uh, and then I saw James Bruton had scaled up a Lego brick, and I was like, oh, I wonder if you could do a whole kit. And I wonder if you did a go-kart, you could make it big enough that you could actually ride a giant scaled Lego-inspired go-kart. <laughs> well, I've done the bulldozer, the tractor, the forklift truck, and I'm doing the car chassis, but I've not scaled anything to this size. So everything else is five times scale. This is 8.3 times scale, just so it's big enough for me to ride, but I'm not, I probably won't ever do anything this scale again. It's just vast amounts of plastic required, you know. What is the biggest challenge of scaling up? To be honest, it's probably time. 
it's time and materials involved, you know, because you go from a two and a half time scale go kart to a five time scale go kart, and you've got eight times the volume, eight times the material, eight times the time. You know, it's just scale. Every time you double the scale, eight times the volume. So, how much rolls of filament do you have at home right now? Probably say about uh, twenty or thirty rolls, uh, but some of them are three kilo. Ah, okay. I was I was just about to say like twenty twenty rolls. That's not that's much. But when you when you mentioned like uh, three kilo rolls, that's that's a lot. What was the most favorite thing that you've seen so far in uh, at Maker Central? Uh, favorite thing I've seen so far, and I've barely looked around to be honest. It's been quite tricky. I've I've had one little tour about. Um, what was my favourite thing I've seen? Actually, it's quite nice. I just love Sam's stuff, to be honest. I love his control panel. I love the way he, he writes his, you know, his, his interfaces and stuff. He's sort of got his, some of it looks laser etched now, but I love the stuff he used to hand write on his controls and just the amount of dials and buttons. So, uh, yeah, it's really nice having Sam as a neighbour. Very inspirational. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to your speech. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. in UK, Maker Central is one of them. What's your favorite thing so far in here? In Maker Central, it's like I would walk around, bump into someone, have a great 15 minute conversation, and then walk for five more minutes and repeat. It's just all like the conversations I've had with people. And it's just made all these little like sparks in my head. But if I would have to pick a physical thing, I think it might be the, uh, the converted van and air stream over there. Like, is it, is it because of all of the wood? The wood's nice, but that airstream is like really big inside. I did not expect that it would be like so livable. I might be exploring that world myself in the future, so it's very inspirational. So on your YouTube series, you work with uh, wood. What is the most challenging thing about uh, working with that medium? Like wood is a, is a natural material that doesn't always behave the way you want it to. When you have a very specific vision in your head and the wood isn't cooperating, that's always hard. How do you feel when you work on a project uh, for a long time and you are particularly proud, but then the feedback from the people that follow you is just like a slightly disappointing? Does it bring you down or you just uh, piggyback on the fact that you are very proud of this and you're okay? Yeah, I get a fair amount of negative comments on my channel and my fiance said something to me, which has been kind of like a guiding mantra, which is that like, you need to decide if the project was a success or a failure before you put it out into the world. Um, so I try not to base my own value on comments like it's great the positive comments are lovely and you know i'll always read constructive criticism um, but i try not to really engage with any negativity on the internet because I, that's not how i want to put myself out there you're based in canada yeah what is the weirdest thing about uk for a canadian person you, you know what i really enjoyed is all of the signage like it tells you a rule but then it gives you a reason for doing it and a lot of times that reason is like because it's the right thing to do. Do not leave rubbish here because it is unsightly. And that's never something you would see in Canada or the US. It would just say, no littering. You know, they, always, they just like tell you what to do. If you had a choice and you could pick anyone that is currently living uh, to work with on a project, who would that be and what would you make together? Anyone, but they have to be alive. They have to be alive. We're not doing zombies. <laughs> I would want to choose someone that like either has a completely different skill than me or is like, way beyond my skill level. I, I really feel like it would be making a video with a very talented filmmaker. It's That's... gonna sound corny, but it might be Casey Neistat. I think making a video with Casey Neistat might okay. be, a, yeah. Uh, I've been using making this channel for about five years. I did have a couple other channels when I was very young. And if we would go back five years, yeah. what would be the single piece of advice you would give it to yourself? Honestly, I'm really happy with the way things went. So I don't know if I would tell myself to change anything. I think I probably could have like, appreciate where I was at the time a little better. So I was living in Montreal when I started my channel, which is an amazing, vibrant city. But all of my videos take place in my apartment. I mean, I mentioned Casey Neistat, right? Like Casey yeah. Neistat uses New York City as a character in his videos. 
I even did some really fun things in the city that I just never even thought of filming. Like one time, the 420 celebration in Montreal is like huge. And I made 100 chocolate chip cookies. Okay. They didn't have drugs in them, but I made 100 chocolate chip cookies and I went and just sold them. And I, that would have been such a fun video to make, but the idea never crossed my mind at the time. Do you find yourself sometimes uh, starting a project and then deciding halfway there that, you know what, I'm just going to do it for myself? I haven't done that, no. I've started projects and then abandoned them, but most of my projects have a video wrapped up in it. I mean, like, I love making the videos. Outside of you, like, when you're not engaging in YouTube and not watching it to kind of benefit you directly when you're doing it for pleasure, what kind of uh, content do you watch? I'm a fan of some of, like, the most popular show, popular um, acclaimed shows right now. So, like, I just watched Severance. I really enjoyed that. Ted Lasso, I really enjoyed that. And I love movies, like... I love Christopher Nolan movies and Quentin Tarantino. But like outside of the makerspace, like Ryan Trahan, the YouTuber, is like one of my big inspirations right now. Like his positivity and energy and genuineness on camera. Um, so I love watching his videos. Do you have a next project already in mind that you're gonna get back to once you're back to Canada? I'm making a, a video that's a story about smashing my watch when I crashed my one wheel because I was showing off for a kid. And this cars? Yeah, I, I, I scraped the skin off of my thumb. I don't know if the camera can see it. Or if it's auto uh, And it's, it doesn't hurt anymore. Yeah. All right. I hope you're going to enjoy the UK trip and have fun. Thanks for interviewing me. It's great talking. Hi Chris, you do woodworking, so tell me all about it. Yes, I am the woodgineer, uh, I've named myself. I do a little bit of woodworking, a little bit of electronics, 3D printing, all sorts of bits and pieces thrown in to make weird and wonderful projects. People don't necessarily want to see, but I love making. And I'm here today on the uh, Vetric stand, representing them as a hobbyist woodworker who uses a CNC machine to do lots of bits and pieces with their software. Which wood is the hardest to work with and Morning isn't the answer. Damn, you beat me to that one. Yeah, pine. Pine. It's it's horrible. I do obviously a lot of wood turning, and you stick pine on there, your tools gunk up with pitch. Everyone seems to keep saying, yeah, yeah, pine, pine pellets, stuff like that. No, it's just not worth it. Start with nice, good quality hardwoods if you're doing anything that you really want to enjoy. If you had to get rid of all of your tools and keep one. Oh, that's a difficult one, because something that I could use to, no, uh, don't use it, but it <laughs> went grim really quickly. Definitely my work beat. Okay. I love that machine. Um, Ooze Nest do a great little machine. I've got a one meter by one meter. Oh, I do a few specific. signs, bits and pieces. It's, it's great for prototyping, but it's, it's great for batch production. And what is your favorite type of projects to work on? It's anything that takes traditional woodworking, throw some electronics or something a bit different in there. I mean, one of my first videos I did was a YouTube subscriber counter. And it was like a nice little wooden plaque, a nice wood carved uh, play button, but with a little LED subscriber counter, just going from the YouTube API, polling that every 30 seconds or so and updating a little readout saying how many subscribers my channel had. I don't do much of woodworking, but yeah. every time I do something, I end up with wood looking very plain and not woodish. How do you make wood look like wood? Anyone can chop a bit of wood up and stick it back together and make all sorts of stuff but what makes it look really nice is a proper finish and it can be as simple as just making sure it's sanded down properly for a start and then also putting a nice coat of something like danish oil even something simple as that especially if you've got a really sexy wood um, what is a sexy wood something with a lovely pattern any of the fruit trees are nice as well but of course you've got things like a roco uh cherry is a nice one as well Sorry, I'm passionate about some of my words, but yeah. I'm still, I'm still laughing about the sexy wood. It is. Have you never like gone to a coffee table or something, a hand and just stopped and started rubbing it? Um, no. no, but I put my hands in the grain. Does it count? There you go. When you're not working on a project, when you're not learning new stuff and you chill on YouTube, what do you watch? I have to be honest, it's mostly other YouTubers. Pretty much everyone you see here today, <laughs> to be honest. I don't have time for gaming channels or sports or whatever that is, and all stuff like that. No, it's all 100% making stuff. Given the opportunity to work with anyone in the world, anyone, not just on YouTube, who would you like to work with and what would that project be? That is genuinely put me on the spot with that one. Someone who's a man after my own heart, although it would probably have to be someone like Matthias Wendel. He's an engineer. I mean, I think he's a software engineer, I believe. 
and he just knows, he seems to know everything. But at the same time, he takes all his electronic and electrical engineering knowledge and sticks it into woodworking and makes things like bandsaws, pantarotors, and just, yeah, he's a bit of an inspiration, and I'd love to do some stuff with him. I already have another project in mind that you're going to work on next, after Maker, Maker Central? I've been a bit inspired, yes. Yeah, I've been chatting to some of, uh, some of the YouTubers, some of the agents, and bits and pieces. They've given me loads of lovely feedback on my channel, and told me all the things I'm doing wrong, but told me all the things I'm doing right and need to lean into to complement all his tools that he's made of wood. I mean, top of my list is probably my blow counter hammer that I've been working on for a little while. It's literally wooden mallet, obviously nice quality wooden mallet, with a readout of how many wax. So when you're in your workshop, you wouldn't uh, like to cross the whack per minute uh, thresholds to potentially hurt, hurt your arm? Do you want to strain the wrists? Yes, that's strain. That's important, important. important for woodworking. Indeed, woodworking. <laughs> Thank you for talking to me, and I hope you're going to enjoy Maker Central. I am, and I'm loving it, and I will. Thank you very much, mate. I'm Ryan Howard and I made Johnny 5. How do you make a Johnny 5? Uh, well, first you start off with a 3D printer. Um, you start 3D printing him and then realise that you can't 3D print something this big. <laughs> yeah, um, it soon collapses under its own weight. Hi, Johnny. <laughs> so then you have to go and get all the really expensive mills and CNCs and lathes. I did most of it over the pandemic, uh, so it kept me busy. And at the end of it, I had a, uh, a Johnny 5. Hey. Hi. To put him on a Weight Watchers scale, what we would show? Uh, but he's somewhere between 250 and about 300 kilogram. So what do you do when you're not in a pandemic? Okay, so I mean, I used to be a forklift engineer and now I'm a full-time student doing engineering. Uh, he, he led me to do... I hope you enjoyed that guys despite the obvious audio issues. You could tell that I had a lot of fun at Maker Central and I'm looking forward to the Maker Central 2024 which is almost a week away. During the edit of this video I've learned a lot of things and hopefully when I'm gonna take my camera back to Maker Central this year uh, none of the issues that I've experienced uh, last year will happen again and I'll test my equipment before I go. So if you're going to be around Maker Central uh, in Birmingham in May 2024 and you'll see me running around with a camera and a lab coat and probably goggles, just say hi. So big thanks to everyone featured in the video. I'm going to link their respective channels and social media in the description of this video, so do check it out. As for me, it's my channel, you know what to do. There's a couple of social media links down below to follow me and my work on and I hope to see you around. Take care.